The morning was promising, with the summer sun shining outside and the scent of flowers wafting in from the open window. Despite it being a weekday, the young beauty didn't need to rush anywhere. Yesterday, Noelle quit her job as an administrator at a fashionable cafe where she had been working for three years. She did so not of her own volition, but at the request of her fiancé, the son of the wealthiest entrepreneurs in their town. Noelle's father was against her decision. It's wrong of you, daughter, to not appreciate the work that you had, he said. If you're not going to work there, then where are you going to go? We don't live in a city, and it's hard to find a good job here. You worked so hard to get this position, and what's next? Are you going to sit at home and depend on your husband's handouts? And here, though you were paid not much money, it was your own money. But the daughter reassured her father, saying, Kevin will figure something out. He'll place me somewhere in their company. I'll be doing paperwork, and I won't be idle. Plus, he doesn't want me to work at the cafe and embarrass his family. Imagine his father's business partners come over, and I'm there working as a waitress in front of them. They'll be ashamed of me. Noelle's father was angry and exclaimed, You're a foolish girl. You don't understand. They're interfering in your life. And you're not even their daughter-in-law yet. What's next? Will they start counting how many calories you've eaten, for example? What if you get fat and embarrass them? And by the way, your father is a former prisoner. They certainly won't want to let me in as their son's father-in-law. But sorry I can't change who I am and erase the shameful stain from my life. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. We don't even know how they've earned their wealth. It's possible to buy a house in Spain with a factory salary. Remember, daughter, if something has arrived, it means somewhere has departed. An old and immutable truth. Oh, that's it. I can't talk about your philosophy too much. Noelle kissed her father on the forehead and left the house. She had a lot to prepare for the wedding, because it was not far off. Noelle stepped out into the sunny day. The girl was at that beautiful age when everything around her seemed cheerful and was painted in bright colours. Noelle grew up as a sociable, kind girl, despite never knowing a mother's love. Her mother died in childbirth without having time to legalise her relationship with Noelle's father because he got into prison. So, the girl only met him in person at the age of ten. Since then, Michael had tried to protect his daughter from all the vicissitudes of fate, fending off any troubles from her. After talking to her father, Noelle went to the most prestigious wedding dress salon. She picked out several beautiful options that were brought to her in the fitting room. The bridal salon was considered the most luxurious in the city, so the fitting room was like a big room with a comfortable couch, table and a small podium with tall mirrors nearby. This way, the bride could see herself from all angles. And while Noelle was trying on another dress and admiring herself in the mirror, she unwillingly overheard the two saleswomen talking behind closed doors. They didn't choose words with their dialogue, as they didn't think anyone was there. Did you hear the news? One of the girls said. Kevin Rifkin is getting married. Can you imagine? No way, the other exclaimed, as if she had heard of some miracle. And who caught him? They say he's quite the ladies' man. Won't miss a single skirt. Well, for young fans of free restaurants and seekers of rich foods, this will be the biggest loss of losses. How many girls has he seduced with a luxurious dinner and a free vacation at the seaside? It's impossible to count. I wonder, whispered the second woman, who did he choose as a wife? Probably someone just as wealthy, or maybe his parents chose a suitable match for him. No, objected the first saleswoman. They say she's just an ordinary girl who works as a waitress in some cafe. Kevin saw her and was struck by her beauty. Good for her. She snagged a rich guy. 
Apparently, she wanted more than just a fancy dinner and a nice vacation. She knows her worth. They say his ex-girlfriend was furious when she found out he was marrying a commoner. Well, she must be a real beauty, said the second woman, since he fell so hard that he's even marrying her. Lucky her. But one thing's for sure, all she wants from him is money, because Kevin Rifkin doesn't shine with beauty or intelligence. Well, what did you expect? replied the other. Someone has to be good-looking in the family, and someone has to earn the money. A man doesn't have to be handsome. A man should be a provider. Oh, well, what kind of provider is he? retorted the conversationalist. He lives off his parents, and he is only listed in the company on paper. They say his deputy does everything for him. This Kevin doesn't know what it's like to rent an apartment or pay for food. Everything he has is from his daddy's gifts. He's the only one in the company who has a position by birthright, not by talent or hard work. I feel sorry for his fiancée. She doesn't know what she's gotten herself into. Money talks, and this is a typical marriage of convenience. The senior saleswoman, helping Noelle try on a dress, suddenly noticed that she was listening to the conversation of the girls behind the door. Therefore, she went out to them and sternly reprimanded them making them keep their tongues in check. I'm not getting married for money. Noelle wanted to scream, but she held back, realising that the scandal could reach the groom's parents, and then nothing good would come of it. They were the kind of people who treasured their family's reputation. All the festive mood had vanished, and Noelle decided not to buy a wedding dress, at least not now and not in this salon. When she came out of the fitting room with a stony face, she scrutinised the saleswomen, who were smiling at her as if nothing had happened. However, they were surprised and disappointed when Noelle did not buy the expensive dress she had chosen, which cost a fortune. Do you get paid from the sales, right? The bride-to-be asked the chatty girls. What a pity. I'll go to another salon where people don't gossip. The senior saleswoman, who had hoped for a fat cheque, realised that the two gossipers had ruined everything and scolded them. Why did you gossip here? Is there not enough work for you? The customer listened to your gossip and she got upset. And what if she tells other customers that the brides are being gossiped about here? We'll go bankrupt like this. The frightened consultants scattered to their own tasks. Meanwhile, Noelle, feeling upset, wandered along the street. Is everything said true, she wondered? My Kevin isn't like that. But the surname, Rifkin, was mentioned. No, I am not going to ruin my wedding because of the silly gossip. Then the girl remembered that today she was going to choose a festive cake and went to the confectionery. Although Kevin's family had hired two specialists to organise the wedding, Noelle still wanted to choose her wedding cake herself. The confectionery offered her different options for this dessert, and she chose a tall five-tiered cake decorated with fruit and berries, and on top it was decided to place mini copies of the bride and groom made of marzipan. After finishing with this, Noelle decided to have a snack and went to the cafe where she used to work. The waiters welcomed her warmly, and the chefs decided to compliment her with a lemon strudel. Only one woman who worked as an accountant in the establishment, was not as pleased as everyone else. Noelle, the woman addressed the girl, taking her aside. Are you sure about this guy? Does he really love you? What do his parents say? I'm worried about you. You grew up without a mother and had no one to teach you practical wisdom. Don't worry, Mrs. Collette, Noelle reassured her. Kevin loves me very much, and his parents are good to me. The wedding is in a week, and I've already ordered a cake and almost picked out a dress. Listen, Noelle, I've never told you this before, but your mum and I used to be friends. Your mum was getting ready for her wedding too, and she brought a dress. Since she lived in a dormitory and had no place to store the wedding dress, your mum gave it to my parents for safekeeping. It's still hanging in their closet, wrapped in a case. 
If you want it, I'll give it to you. Oh my goodness, of course I want it, exclaimed a delighted Noel. I want to see Mummy's dress. Okay, come back after my shift and I'll give it to you, said the accountant, smiling. Three hours later, Noel and Mrs. Collett arrived at her parents' house. When they entered, Mrs. Collett's mother sitting by the window was surprised to see Noel. Chloe, you're here. How are you doing? she asked. Mum, this is not Chloe, but her daughter. Her name is Noel. Mrs. Collett corrected the elderly woman. Oh, sure, but she looks like her, she said, clasping her hands to her chest. Mrs. Collett took out a dress. It was made of fine, expensive material and was embroidered with crystals. The fabric had not darkened or deteriorated in any way over time, and the stones shone like new. Noel noticed that the style suited her very well, both in size and taste. Not for nothing, they say, that fashion is cyclical. So the dress was at the peak of today's fashion, and Noel was thrilled. It was what she had been looking for, but could never find. Thanking her former colleague and her mother's friend, Noelle took the dress and flew home, as if on wings, to please her father and show him her find. "'Dad, look what I have!' exclaimed the girl as she ran home. "'This is Mum's dress. Mrs. Collett gave it to me. Imagine, they used to be friends.' "'Anne Collett?' asked Noelle's father. "'I remember her. Yes, she used to be firm friends with your mother. But... Back then, she married and went to another town. I know, she told me. Well, look what she gave me. Noelle unfolded the dress to show her father. This is Mum's dress that she never had the chance to wear to your wedding. Michael was thunderstruck. It was the first time he had seen his bride's dress. Tears rolled down his face. He remembered everything. How happy they were, how they were preparing for the celebration. Dad, don't cry. Everything is fine, Noel consoled him. This beautiful dress will see the world finally, and Mum's dream will come true. Only instead of her, I will wear it. Just imagine, it fits me just right. When Noel put on the dress and showed her father its beauty, he suddenly realised that this was the last week he would spend with his daughter. A heavy sadness shadowed his face, not because Noel would be getting married and leaving the family, but because he did not trust Kevin, her fiancé. Noel's father was a good judge of character. Meanwhile, the closer the wedding day approached, the more Kevin doubted the correctness of his choice. His friends kept adding fuel to the fire. "'You're only twenty-five, they said. "'Look, there are so many more fish in the sea, and you choose some flounder.' "'Noel is not a flounder.' answered the groom, trying to calm himself. I chose her, and now she's my bride. Show some respect, or I won't invite you to the wedding. Come on, we want what's best for you, said Kevin's buddies, who were also the same daddy's boys as Kevin. It's just a pity that you're leaving our bachelor parties. The wedding ring will put you to the ground. I'm not going to die, I'm only getting married, but I'm not going to leave our parties. Kevin parried, but his doubts were growing like a snowball. Kevin tried not to listen to his friends. However, his heart always sank when he passed by some beauty with a luxurious figure and a frank look. Nevertheless, he always took himself in hand. He remembered Noel and prepared for their upcoming wedding. Being in a state of frustration and doubt, the guy did not find support from his own parents either. Son... His worried mother said, Have you changed your mind about getting married? I don't want to say anything bad about your girlfriend, but she's not your equal. She's too simple and tasteless. She doesn't even know how to behave at the table. She doesn't use a knife. And she doesn't know which fork is for the salad. And her clothes. I was shocked when Noelle came to meet us in her white blouse with creepy roses. Then I thought... Is she going to be my daughter-in-law? Well, honey, you're exaggerating, the father interjected. The blouse was decent. Yes, the girl is good. She looks up to Kevin and will obey us. You won't get any surprises from her, except for a couple of grandchildren. 
but her father worries me. He's been in jail for ten years. Doesn't that bother you? How am I going to tell my partners that my daughter-in-law's father was a convict? Half the investors would turn their backs on me. I didn't think Kevin would go this far. Is she pregnant? She's not pregnant, snapped Kevin. I thought I was really in love with her, and now I begin to doubt whether Noelle was suitable for my future life. She's so modest that it's getting sugary. Well, don't get married then, said her mother to Kevin. Nobody's forcing you. Yeah, replied the guy. But what will people in town say? That Kevin Rifkin doesn't keep his word? No, she must cancel the wedding herself. I've already hinted at her, but she's so naive she doesn't understand any hints. I've been late for dates and I've been rude, and I haven't paid for her in cafes. I made her quit her job, but to no avail, she left me no choice. I have to rip the love off my fiance like a band aid. It hurts, but it's quick. While Noelle was trying on her dress, sending them to the dry cleaner, and getting excited about the wedding, Kevin was preparing a trick to embarrass his former love, which would make his bride a laughing stock. The day before the wedding, Kevin called Noelle. Honey, let's meet tomorrow at the registry office," suggested the groom. "We'll save time and avoid the traffic jams getting to your house." Okay, Noel agreed, not sensing a catch. As you say, so it will be. I don't care as long as you're near. Finally, Noel's long-awaited wedding day arrived. She trembled at the thought of soon becoming Kevin's wife. She fluttered around the house like a butterfly, unable to sit still. While the hairdresser did her hair, but at last everything was ready. It's a strange trend these days. Brides get to the wedding by themselves. The world's gone crazy. Marvelled the cab driver. Well, it's not a problem for me. Noel said to the cab driver. We'll meet the groom right at the registry office. It's more convenient for him. Still strange, muttered the man. I've been a driver at many weddings, and the grooms have always been next to the brides. While Noel was arguing with the cab driver, Noel's father was looking at an old photograph of his deceased wife. Well, darling, I'm giving away our daughter in marriage. She's all grown up now, as you see. I am staying at home. Don't ask. The groom's parents didn't want to see me at their rich feast. They said I'd embarrass the guests, but I know those guests. They're not embarrassed to steal on a huge scale from the people in the state, but when they see an ex-cop, they're scared to death. They are embarrassed to see us ordinary people in their circle. I wish I knew how you are there, my dear. When Noel arrived at the wedding, she found that all the guests had already gathered at the door of the ceremonial hall. They were very surprised that the bride had entered alone and unaccompanied, but the maid of honor explained to the others that this was the agreement with the groom. Some of the women shook their heads reproachfully. The men looked at each other, many of them not understanding the strange behavior of the young people. The ceremony was about to begin, and Kevin was still absent. Noel called him, but his phone was unavailable. She started to panic. And her friend tried to calm her down. She said that maybe the groom's motorcade was stuck in traffic. However, Noel didn't believe it any more, and she wanted to cry. Kevin's father and mother sat nonchalantly in the chairs, drinking champagne, and calmly observing the general turmoil. Where is Kevin? Maybe you managed to reach him. The bride asked the groom's parents worriedly. It's you who should know, honey. Where your future husband is, don't ask us, please," Kevin's mother replied arrogantly. "Why didn't you come here together? By the way, my son said that you were out of sorts yesterday. Is that so? Not at all," exclaimed the bride. "He himself suggested we meet here, just before the ceremony. I don't understand what's going on. I thought maybe you knew." Kevin's mother said nothing and turned away. And not wanting to see Noel's tears, she continued her conversation with her equally pompous friend. Kevin and his friends didn't show up at the wedding in the next hour. The guests slowly began to disperse, bewildered and indignant that they were invited to a wedding 
but made to wait. Many were offended, considering it disrespectful to them. The poor bride was left in shock, trembling like a leaf in the wind. Among the guests, rumours began to spread that Noel was to blame for it all. Supposedly, she had caused the groom to have a breakdown, which was why he did not come. No matter how much she tried to refute this false assumption, no one believed her. People preferred to side with the rich and powerful, rather than with a poor girl whose own father did not even attend her wedding. Of course, the gossipers did not know that the bride's father had been forbidden from attending the wedding. Noelle left the wedding the last. Her friends supported her in any way they could, but the girl was inconsolable. She cried the entire way home and arrived with a face swollen from tears and smeared makeup. When her father saw her in that state, he was shocked. What's wrong? Why are you crying? And why did you come back here? Did you and Kevin have a fight? No, I didn't quarrel with anyone. I only made a fool of myself, Noelle said through sobs. Kevin didn't come to the wedding. His parents made it look like it was my fault. I drove their sonny to madness, and he refused to marry me. I've never been so humiliated. But how could he do that to me? He set me up. And why? I didn't do anything wrong. How am I supposed to live? I resigned from my job, thinking I'll work with him in their company. It turns out now that nothing will happen. No wedding, no husband, no job, no happiness. I won't let him get away with this, screamed her father. He will pay for everything and so will his family. How dare they hurt and humiliate a girl in front of everyone? I think he just changed his mind about getting married and was afraid to tell the truth, like all mama's boys. I've never liked him, and his parents probably knew his plan very well. That's why they were so calm. Noel's father was furious. He had swallowed the offense that they had inflicted on him when they told him not to come to the wedding but he would not allow anyone to harm their own child. The man began to pick his best suit, shirt and tie and to polish his shoes. Noel noticed that and blocked his way. Dad, you're not going anywhere. What if they provoke you and you end up in jail again? How will I manage without you? I can't bear it a second time. The man looked at his daughter and saw that she could barely stand on her feet from excitement and grief and he did what any loving father would do in such a situation. He gave in. Then, the man said, we're going to make a delicious lunch. Remember how once you and I burned everything in the oven? Let's try better this time, because I'm hungry. I haven't had a dew drop in my mouth all day. Noelle smiled through her tears and nodded her head. She realized that there would be no one in the world more dear to her than her father. Noelle knew that her father was trying to distract her somehow, so she agreed to the proposal. During the evening, they cooked so many delicious things that they had to eat them for the three whole days and even call Noelle's friends for help. The girls brought her the latest news about Kevin and his family. The former fiancé had already found a new girlfriend, a long-legged beauty from a modeling agency which left and right to siphon off his money completely unashamed. And Kevin's parents flew on vacation abroad, the very place where the newlyweds wanted to go after the wedding. Noelle was angry and grief-stricken at the same time. She was filled with resentment because she gave up almost everything for Kevin and spent almost a year of her life on him, all for nothing. While his daughter experienced the betrayal of her fiancé, Michael thought over a plan of revenge. Of course, no criminal act was intended. However, he had a plan to put the arrogant rich in their place. Once, Noel's father was a businessman. Back then, everyone was spinning as best they could. And Michael, together with a friend, wanted to pull off one financial scam, after which they would become millionaires. But their plan failed. Noel's father was arrested for financial crime and sent to a pre-trial detention centre. The trial was demonstrative, 
so Michael was given the maximum, 10 years. Michael's friend had a sick wife in his care, so he took all the blame on himself, making his friend a witness in the case. For this, the companion swore that he would be more than willing to pay for the rescue. Unfortunately, a year later, his friend's wife died of illness. When Michael was already in prison, his fiance Noel's mother, told him that she was expecting his child. She was happy that she was pregnant, and Michael was upset because he knew perfectly well that he would not see the baby's first steps and would not hear him called Daddy. Then the bride reassured him that she would definitely wait for him, but fate ordered otherwise. Noel's mother died during childbirth, so the girl was given to an orphanage. Michael's friend, as he could, fought with bureaucrats for custody of the little girl, but since he was a widower, he was denied custody. Only ten years later, the father took his daughter out of the orphanage. The companion, who managed to dodge justice, constantly visited Noel's father, and every time he said that he owed him for the rest of his life and that, if necessary, he would fulfill any wish. Michael always refused the offer, the business had brought him nothing but grief, and therefore he had no intention of having anything more to do with it. But now the man realised it was time to pay the bills, and he turned to his friend for help. Late in the evening, in the mansion that looked more like a castle than a family nest, the bell rang. Hello, Bernard, said Noel's father to the receiver. It's been a long time since I've called you. I need your help. Let's meet tomorrow and talk. Glad to hear from you, Michael, said the owner of the mansion. Good, I'll send a car for you. The next evening, a luxurious black limousine pulled up to an ordinary apartment building. At the same time, Michael came out of the entrance and got in. The driver carefully slammed the door behind him, and the car started gently and drove off in an unknown direction. The neighbours opened their mouths in amazement and then began to discuss that their neighbour might be a hidden millionaire. The car brought Michael to the bank doors, where his old friend Bernard was waiting for him. They warmly embraced each other and entered the building, surprising the employees, who had never seen their boss so happy or even smile at a person in jeans and a checkered shirt. Michael stood out among the black and white clad employees like a bright spot. Inside the office, a few cups of coffee and small appetizing sandwiches were waiting for them on the table. Well, Michael, exclaimed the bank owner joyfully, I'm glad you need me at last, and I'll help you in any situation, whatever it may be. Have some coffee, treat yourself, and tell me what happened. Michael refused treats as anger and resentment choked him. What happened wasn't with me, Bernard, but with my daughter. Michael heard in a voice trembling with anger. You know those Rifkins, the local Nouveau Riche? I know them, of course. They have two major companies, and we finance them and provide credit. They have just applied for a large loan yesterday. Tonight, we'll gather the bank's board to decide on this matter. The sum is serious. Well, their family insulted and mocked my daughter, Michael said. She has already tasted a bitter fate. Her mother died and she lived in an orphanage. I was in jail. And now they decided to dump her at the wedding. Can you imagine how she's feeling now? Their spoiled son simply didn't show up at the wedding while they were sipping champagne and watching my daughter suffer. This shouldn't go unpunished, Bernard exclaimed. What do you suggest? I suggest punishing the entire family, and since they love money so much, they should be deprived of it. You can refuse to give them credit, ask other banks to deny them any, even the smallest amount? Of course I can. I'll ruin their reputation so much that even the investors they've been luring for the past year will leave. Thank God. I still have weight and influence among powerful people in the city. I'm not boasting, but everything will be as you want it to be. Thank you. That's great. Michael exclaimed happily. Let people know 
what unreliable partners they are, that they can't even sort out things within their own family, let alone with other people's money or business. You're right, a strong family is the main indicator. We should drink to that, and not just coffee. The friends left the office laughing, heading to the most expensive restaurant in the city, where they spent the whole evening reminiscing about their youth. The anger that had taken hold of Michael's heart released him. He was happy to see his friend and receive his help. Now, his little girl would be avenged. While Noel was searching for the strength to return to her old life and forget the betrayal of her fiancé, Kevin enjoyed the company of a capricious model who only begged for expensive gifts and took her wallet to trendy places. The young man rarely showed up at work, and that started to outrage the company's management. People wondered how someone could be a vice president of a large company and not delve into the business, completely unloading all the responsibilities onto other people. But Kevin Rifkin did not care about the feelings of any employees. He spent inconceivable money on entertainment, travel, and paying for the maintenance of his beauty and buddies. And the employees were told that there was no money for bonuses and salary increases due to some difficult economic situation in the world. Everyone understood that it was a blatant and arrogant lie, but they couldn't do anything about it as they would be quickly dismissed. The employees endured it, silently hiding their offended eyes from their bosses. After all, many of them needed to support their families and pay for loans and mortgages. Not everyone was lucky enough to be born with a silver spoon in their mouth, and so everyone envied Kevin and quietly hated him for his luxurious life and carelessness. When Kevin's father received a response from the bank, he was shocked. The document stated that his loan was denied. Due to bad news, he suffered a stroke while on vacation. There was no talk of company leadership. He needed to fight the illness and regain his strength. However, his wife seemed more concerned about not being able to maintain their luxurious lifestyle than her husband's health. What now? I won't be able to buy the diamond necklace I ordered from the famous Swiss master. Will I? I have been waiting a year for my turn, she lamented next to her sick husband. What will I tell my friends, that I'm poor? Let me sleep, Kevin's father weakly responded. You have a mess in your head. Call our son and tell him to take over the company. Meanwhile, the women's rich friends were aware of their financial problems and refused to meet with them. They were afraid that Mrs. Rifkin would ask for help and financial injections from their husbands. No one wanted to sink with them. By some sixth sense, the rich friends understood that something was wrong here and that there was a hidden campaign against the Rifkins, so they were afraid to be in the same boat with them. Son, your father won't be able to lead the company. Now it's time for a real job. You have to keep the company afloat. Your father is having difficulty speaking, but the doctors promise that he will recover. Therefore, for all actions and decisions, you are responsible. Do what you want, but get the funds for development and employee salaries. Just don't tell anyone that we are in trouble. Kevin's mother called him from vacation. Maybe you'll become the boss yourself, said an unhappy Kevin. I have a party tomorrow. I paid for a famous band to sing for my girlfriend and friends. We can't cancel the celebration. Are you crazy? exclaimed his mother. What band? We can't afford to pay people. No parties for now. Kevin, go to work. We gave you a good education and entrusted you with a high position. We'll be back soon, and I want to fix the situation by the time I arrive, otherwise you'll lose your inheritance. This threat immediately affected the young man, and he began calling his friends to cancel the party. The band will have to pay a penalty, but he wasn't going to tell his parents about it. When the beautiful girlfriend found out that Kevin had no more financial opportunities, she quickly found another source of money and easily jumped on it. 
However, she refused to return the money and precious gifts that Kevin had given her, despite all his requests. The girl said straight to Kevin's face that it was payment for the fact that she adorned an unremarkable wealthy son with her presence. Kevin was in shock. He wasn't used to refusals, much less such insulting statements. He remembered his Noel, who was gentle and affectionate with him, and doubts crept into his heart that he had offended the only girl who sincerely loved him. He suddenly felt that everything that was happening to his family was divine retribution for the offence he had caused to an innocent person. He decided to call his ex fiance but she blocked his number, and the young man realised that all the ways back were cut off. The young businessman needed to focus on the company, so the next morning he gathered the meeting to get a plan from top managers on how to get out of the debt pit and not let the company be sold off in parts. However, the disrespect and suppression of human opinion, which were practised for years in the company by his father, now made themselves felt. Heads of departments and managers were afraid to express their opinions on the company's development, fearing that they might be fired, like some employees in the past. Kevin did not get any clear answers or proposals from his subordinates, whose eyes and even mannerisms were full of fear. And then the young man decided to act independently, relying on his limited knowledge of business. Only now did he realize that he was not worthy of this position, simply because he did not possess the necessary knowledge. This realization greatly oppressed him, and his worries found no support anywhere. He vented his anger on his parents, blaming them for raising him so lazy and stupid. Do you hear what the owner's son said? One director said to another. He talked such nonsense that my eyes went dark. Time to pack up and abandon this sinking ship, said the second executive. At this rate, this financial genius will lead the company to bankruptcy. I feel sorry for the people who are hoping for these jobs. All because he didn't study and learn from his father and deputies in his time, retorted the other person. See how it all turned out. The father had a heart attack and the son doesn't have the skills to manage such a big company. Now their golden days are over. I wish I could say that to his arrogant face. The experienced manager's prophecy came true quickly. Kevin Rifkin turned out to be not only a weak leader, but also a poor financier. Despite studying abroad, it was clear that he spent more time in bars than in university lecture halls. Soon, Kevin urgently needed money to cover the company's operating expenses, and the young president decided to take out loans from all the banks that his family had not yet applied to. I want to talk to the owner of the bank, Kevin arrogantly said to the manager when he arrived at the credit department of one of the city's financial institutions. The manager went upstairs to deliver the message. And ten minutes later, he said that Kevin would have to wait at least an hour. Kevin was furious. He had never been made to wait for even five minutes, let alone an hour. But he couldn't do anything about it. An hour later, the secretary invited him upstairs. Good evening, Mr. Rifkin, the bank's head greeted Kevin. I understand that you want to apply for a huge loan at our bank. Yes, the young man said discontentedly. Do you know why I've been sitting here for over an hour? I would like to take out a credit at your bank. Let me sign where I need to and get the money. You're impudent, young man, the banker replied seriously and frowned. Your speech is unworthy of the vice president of a company. That's the first thing. And secondly, your credit has been refused. But why? exclaimed Kevin. Unfortunately, your family has a bad credit history, the bank's head stated clearly. You can't go to other banks. They will refuse you for the same reason. And now please leave the premises. I have a lot of work to do. Kevin was furious. He realized that there was some kind of conspiracy going on, but why? 
Had his father made a mistake somewhere and crossed paths with some influential person? Two weeks later, Kevin had nothing left to pay his employees' salaries. People filed resignation letters and sued the company for non-payment of earned wages. The judge demanded that the company immediately pay off its debts to employees and creditors. Kevin and his mother had nothing left to do but sell the company at a bargain price, and they put the company's shares, which had fallen to a minimum, up for sale. As soon as they hit the market, someone bought them up wholesale. The money from the sale went straight into Kevin's account. Now it was time for him to look for a job himself. His mother, who had never worked anywhere before, and had lived off her husband's money, was at a loss. She had no idea how ordinary people live. She cried for a long time, complained about her life, but no one felt sorry for her. Meanwhile, Kevin was very curious to know who had become the owner of their family company, and he was unpleasantly surprised when he arrived at the building's hall, where his luxurious office used to be, and the security guard did not let him in. Not allowed, said the man sternly to the former owner, who had passed by him hundreds of times before. The new owner's ordered not to let you in. How dare you! Kevin shouted. Just a week ago, everything here belonged to me. What's done is done, came a voice from behind. And don't you dare shout at my employees. Kevin turned around. Behind him were Michael Oliphant and his daughter, Noelle. Hello, Kevin, greeted Noelle, addressing her former fiancé. What are you raging about? So it was you who took over my company, he asked in a threatening tone. Not taken over, but bought, corrected Michael. I paid the price you set. It's your problem that you couldn't keep the company afloat when your father was sick. You should have been respectful of the business and the rest of the people too. I get it, exclaimed the guy. It was you who turned the banks against us. It's your fault they wouldn't give us a loan. To be fair, you're the reason the company went bankrupt. Your boorish attitude towards people, laziness and negligence caused it, parried Michael. Stop blaming people for your mistakes, said Noel. So Kevin, you will have to look for a job to support yourself and your parents. We can make you a gesture of goodwill and offer you a job as an ordinary manager. You, like the rest of your co-workers, could rise to a management position from the bottom, if you'd like to, of course. While they were chatting, Michael and his associates were approached by a secretary who used to work for Kevin's father. Everyone is waiting for you at the board of directors. It starts in five minutes, the woman said, greeting Kevin as well. Hello, Mr. Rifkin. When Kevin heard that people he considered beggars were called to the board of directors where his father ruled, the unsuccessful businessman seemed to be furious. Don't forget, you're talking to the owner's son, he shouted to the secretary and then turned to Noel. How dare you insult me by offering the position of junior manager? You're the son of the former owner. Be correct, please, Noel started answering, but unable to listen more, Kevin ran out of the hall. Tears of anger choked him as he was humiliated in front of the junior employees of the company. He couldn't understand how Michael Oliphant managed to acquire every single share of the company or where he got the means to do so. But people like Kevin did not understand what real male friendship was. The money that Michael used to buy all the company's property was given to him by a friend who Noel's father had once saved from prison. Furious, Kevin decided to win Noel back, believing that if she forgave him, things would return to normal. When Kevin's anger became cold, the guy decided to get Noel back. He knew that if she forgave him, things would go back to normal for him. Hi, honey, Kevin said, calling Noel's work number. Do you still resent me? Why don't we go out and you forgive me? I miss you. Hello, Kevin, the girl replied. Of course I have forgiven you. 
but I won't go anywhere with you because I don't want to. Our love is already in the distant past, and you know it yourself. And you can come to work tomorrow. It's time to become an adult. Anger and rage consumed Kevin, but he did not give up the offered job. The next day, he began his duties as manager. Kevin knew how to wear a mask, so at work he maintained an indifferent look. But at home, he was torn and furious. Unfortunately, his evil genius could not think of anything better than to take revenge on Noel and her father. One late night, Kevin went to a bar on the outskirts of the city, where marginal personalities congregated. Hello, he addressed the bartender. Can you tell me who needs easy money here? I've got some work to do. I need to teach someone a lesson. I'll pay well. Kevin handed the bartender rolled-up bills. Hello, the bartender replied. See that guy standing over there, all tattooed. Go to him. Kevin left some bills to the bartender and went to the big guy. Hi, I heard that you could do a job for me. I need to put someone in this place. I'll pay well. Kevin wrote on a napkin the amount he was prepared to pay for the order. All right, agreed the bandit. Name the place and time. Money up front. That same evening, Kevin's verdict was carried out. That evening, Noel went home alone. As soon as she reached the middle, the path was blocked by a huge man. Are you Noel? Asked the man. I am, said the surprised girl. Why? But she had no time to get an answer to the question. Because it was immediately followed by a blow to her stomach, the girl screamed and fell down. She began to call for help, but there was not a soul around. She tried to run, managed to get up somehow, but the stranger grabbed her hair from behind and pushed her. In the man's hands was an iron rod. Noel thought her life was over until someone hit the attacker on the head from behind. The man fell down. Can you get up? Lean on me and let's go faster. He'll wake up soon. A male voice was heard. Who are you? Just a passerby. I heard someone screaming, so I decided to help. Noel calmed down and decided to look at her savior. He was a young man, about twenty-five years old. His clothes were quite worn, but clean and tidy. It was obvious that the guy wasn't wealthy. Where do you live? He asked. Two stops from here," Noel replied. "That's a bit far. Shall we go to my place and get your abrasions treated?" "What's your name?" she asked. "I'm Noel. You are?" "Will," he replied. When they reached Will's house, Noel stopped at the entrance. It was hard to call it a house, more like a hovel. When they entered, Noel found that inside everything looked not so bad. A girl about ten years old came out of a small room. "Meet," said Will. "This is my niece Molly, and this is Noel. She was almost killed just now." Molly gasped in shock. "There are a lot of psychos around," said Noel. Molly quickly set the table, and soon scones, cheese, and strong tea appeared before them. "Eat," said the girl. "You need to regain your strength, and then we'll take you home." It was very pleasant and warm for Noel to be their guest. Two hours later, they arrived at Noel's apartment. The father was worried because he couldn't reach his daughter. When he found out what had happened, he was shocked and truly grateful to Will. But at the same time, he couldn't stop staring at Will's face. He looked very familiar. There was only one person with an identical appearance: his friend in the colony. Who had protected Michael from the other prisoners by covering him with himself? The friend was killed by a self-made knife. Wasn't your father's name Ivan? Yeah, Ivan. Will answered in surprise. How did you guess? Michael sighed. Ivan was my friend and died for me. So now you are like a son to me. Stay with Molly at our place. The young man was pleased that someone knew his father and offered him help. He told his new friends that the apartment had been taken away from them 
by black realtors. Then he found an empty old house and started living there. And later, disaster struck. His sister and her husband died in a car accident. Their daughter Molly became an orphan and Will had to take her in. His dead sister had a friend who helped Will formalize guardianship over the girl. That was Molly and Will's sad life story. The next day, Michael invited Will to work for his company. Seeing that Noel was unharmed, Kevin got furious. In addition, he was angry that some vagrant from the street took the prestigious position of a PR manager. After another hour, the security service reported to Michael exactly who had organized the attempt. Get out, Michael shouted at Kevin, and I advise you to go to the police with a heartfelt confession. Kevin went home like a beaten dog, and there he was met by his sick father and furious mother, who shouted and scolded her loser son. Having received a suspended sentence, Kevin, like all weak-spirited people, started drinking himself black. When the stock of money ran out, he began to sell valuable things from the house, and the funds received were used to drink. Soon, the Rifkins family was completely forgotten, and Will and Noel announced the wedding. The wedding was held with a bang. Colleagues and family friends were invited, and three months later, Noel said that Michael would soon become the grandfather of a grandson.